So uh, thanks a lot to, for the invitation. Um, I was speaking at the similar workshop two years ago, and uh, I had a very unique and uh, extremely nice experience. And this morning when I arrived, I started to feel that this workshop again will be probably the same. And so I'm very happy and very honored to be there. I would like to thank the organizer, in particular Jean-Paul, uh, for inviting me today and uh, during this uh, very uh, nice event. So today, since we have a bit of a uh, uh, flickering stuff going in, I don't know, probably cable stuff. Um, I would like to talk about like creating uh, personalized dynamic models. So there are things that have been already uh, kind of like talked about this morning, and there are like a few things I would like to add up. Um, starting from the point of view of robotics, and then going towards uh, human. So I'm a roboticist, but I work a lot in, uh, in humans, and everything started for me with these equations, which is very similar to the one that, uh, uh, for example, Russell presented this morning. He said that he has Lagrangian, and I don't have Lagrangian here, but basically it's kind of like very similar. And then when we apply that to our robots, we have our robots moving and doing stuff. And then we can compute quarks, and then we have here the inertia and the acceleration, the joint accelerations. We have the Coriolis effect. It's very weird what's happening. Um, and then we have uh, the gravity effect. And of course, when we're going and working with humanoid robots or with light systems, uh, we have this equation slightly changed because we have the properties, the inherent properties of the moving system which says that, like, if you look at the bottom equation, it's basically exactly the same that we have before, except that I had it up here with external forces. But if we look at the upper part, what do we have here it is the equation of motion of a free body in the three-dimensional space. So basically, we have to take a reference for one of the links here and say, well, this is a free body in the space. And then from this free body in the space, we have a kinematic chain. And the kinematic chain is moving with through the constraints that are defined by the joints that are um, in our system. And so here, what we have here is our robot that is doing um, um, a motion, self-generated motion for uh, identification. Um, and then um, when we do that, what do we need actually? What do we need to measure? So when we want to know the dynamics of our system and eventually the kinematics of our system, uh, we need to measure part of this equation. So, for example, if you have the external forces and if you measure the joint torque, then we can compute, and if you measure the joint angles, then we can compute the parameters that are constant parameters that appear in the equation, and that's what we're interested in, in terms of, like, personalized models, because we want to know what are the specific models. Yes, sometimes we see somebody coming in because they're scared of the rope from the but actually didn't. Um, and and, uh, and so we want to have these very specific parameters uh, that are the uh, personal parameters and that are the characterization of the dynamic models. Of course, we cannot go with this kind of equation and this kind of system as model as much detail as the one that Russell presented this morning. Uh, we don't go in deep into the joint models and this kind of thing, but uh, we have at least access to a certain number of information. So. Um, what do we need uh, to do that on humans? Well, basically, we need the kind of like similar information. And now uh, we just need the accelerations and, of course, uh, the integration, let's and position of our base. And then we also need the joint angles, velocities, and accelerations. And we need the contact forces. And we're lucky enough uh, now to have access to a certain number of equipments that give us this information. And in particular, um, we have lab-grade expensive equipment, but we also have more cheap and uh, not as bad, um, like, as, like almost as reliable as these very expensive equipment so that we can really export this technology and make it very uh, available to everyone. And so, exactly like what we had on the robots doing this like kind of dance, uh, self-generated, we can do the same thing for humans. So this is work that is quite now, um, I could say old, uh, but I was done in collaboration with Prof. Nakamura at the University of Tokyo when I was working there. Um, and the idea is to use 
So the lower part of the equation that was changed before, and so we don't need to bring cross. And with the given, it's good because we can actually remove the original perfection, right? We have too many joints, and we have not access to this information. But by using only the upper part of the equation I was showing you earlier, we just need to remove the contact forces, and then we remove the movement with the motion capture system, and then we can find this method here and the parameters here that we would like to see. And so exactly like the robot was doing some kind of dance, with human doing this kind of dance too. Uh, by eventually changing contact with them here. Uh, we can find, and that's what's happening here when the color is changing, we can find these parameters that appear in the equation, which are basically what we call the dynamic parameters, which are the mass, the position of the center of mass, and the inertia matrix of all of each of these things in the parameter. And the more the person here becomes green, the more the parameters are identified with high accuracy and confidence, and so we can say that at some point we're done and we can um, uh, we can reconstruct them uh, and use this equation um, with a very good um, accuracy. The second thing that we did also at the same time is like, well, it's sometimes annoying to have to meet other force. What's happening when humans are flying? I mean, they don't really fly actually, but they can jump. And so, again, work that we were doing at the University of Tokyo uh, quite some time ago, and we had our very nice students jumping in the motion capture, and so we knew only the moment when he was uh, jumping, so when the forces are actually zero, he's just flying in the air. And uh, again, we can use um, total d squared to solve this problem, and then we have access to the same parameters. Very nice. And so we applied that, not the jumping one, I thought, <laughs> uh, to stroke patients. And um, in stroke patients, um, it's very interesting because I mean, all this identification, you could think like, well, it's not very like, it's not very useful to do identification. Why would you bother doing identification when you have these like very nice Tarkovsky tables that gives you the information about the dynamic parameters or these like Yuma interpolation rules that also give you the dynamic parameters from like database, basically, or like anthropometric tables. Well, when you work with populations, when you work with populations that are not part of this very specific population that was used to define this anthropometric table, the anthropometric table doesn't really work. And that's what exactly we're seeing here. So I'm sorry that there's a little shift here. But the, like the green bars here are the patient's uh, parameters that we identified. And the blue one and the one that we uh, interpolated using the uh, generalized as a first piece parameters, which are for healthy, normal population. But we have here a stroke patient, a post stroke patient with a credit side. And obviously, what you can find, and it's something that you could have guessed, is that, for example, the right height and the left height are very different parameters. And in particular, these are the masses. So, this is the percentage of the columns of the body, have very different right and left masses which you couldn't find when you were using database because databases assume that right and left is the same. So database works very well when you have healthy people, very standard people, but as soon as you go to different population, it doesn't work that good. And so this here is something that is very important and that shows that like, as soon as you're working with different populations, your model starts to give you, let's say, not so accurate results uh, if you use standardized parameters then in, you use the identified parameters with the method that I just showed you that is not very difficult, I think. Uh, once you have choose the model that you want to identify, and everyone that is doing motion analysis at some point has a model, if you are planning to do a dynamic computation, you have a model, then just putting these parameters takes like two minutes. As soon as you're doing motion capture, uh, like you're taking motion capture, it takes just two more minutes to do the calibration, the dynamic calibration, and to obtain the green bar instead of the blue bar, for example. And so now we can apply these methods, and we can do a lot of things with that. Not just only with standard population, because now we have access to parameters to pretty much everyone we want to. Not just like a parameter that we will kind of interpolate from the total mass and the total size, but a parameter that is very specific to one person. And so one thing we started to work on was to try to do dynamic consistent inverse kinematics. 
Why? Well, it's because um, this is a little bit related again to what uh, Professor Aldrin was saying this morning about this like soft tissue artifacts and these inverse kinematics computations. It's like we assume as soon as we have a kinematic model that we can do the inverse kinematics and compute the joint or the transformation matrix between uh, the different uh, links. And we just take into account the marker position when you're using motion more, capture, more right? So basically, you try to minimize the error between the marker that you have measured and the marker that you can predict in your model. And then that's all what you do, and then you compute the joint angle. But when you want to do dynamic computation on top of that, it's interesting to try to use the forces also as a computational input. Because if we have forces, when you want to do the inverse kinematics and the inverse dynamic computation, if you put forces in the loop, you can minimize both the marker error and the forces error so that you drive a model already into the inverse dynamic computation that you want to obtain, trying also to minimize the error on the forces rather than just minimizing on the error and then accounting for whatever uh, at some point in kind of like big soup when you're doing the inverse dynamics. So what we propose is to use the force light, both the force light and the motion type transformation and to both try to minimize the marker trajectories and the ground and external branches. And we have a two layer optimization. One is doing the inverse kinematics. So we try to minimize to point the joint angles, velocities, and acceleration at the same time. That minimizes both the marker uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, and the ground reaction forces. And then what we're doing is once we have these, we also recompute the dynamic parameters that we have, like in a several like iteration computation. And we update both the geometric parameters, we compute the lengths of the segments, and the dynamic parameters. There is like a bit of shit. And then what we have in the output is the joint positions, the velocities, the accelerations, the geometric parameters, and the body segment in our parameters. So basically the dynamic parameters. And what we showed is that, like, well, for the markers, so these are the results we obtain for the markers optimization for a random motion. Uh, these are all the markers that we had in our model. And these are, so the measured one, the optimized in blue, and the green, the optimized with just purely kinematic data. So we basically have very similar results, except from here, where our optimization method is not performing as well when you just want to optimize the markers. But when you look at the forces, it's what's very interesting is that you really like get the point here is that with the purpose method, we match much more better the forces than when you just optimize the index or when you just do the kinematic computation. And it's because of the fear that you have us. It doesn't make anything like <laughs> But the idea is like when you want to do inverse dynamics computation as a goal, it's better from the beginning to try to do the inverse kinematics and start here uh, because because if you just do pure inverse kinematics and pure inverse dynamics, you obtain this kind of like green curves. And in particular, for the moment of force, you see that like a lot of different things are happening. So this is the vertical force, and this is going to be the uh, uh, transition force. So we have like a, a plan of model for this uh, small uh, experiment. Uh, but this is basically what you have. So if you think again, a kind of like semi plan of model. The other thing that you can do now is like once you have, you are able to compute the forces accurately with your dynamic parameters and your model, is to compact to do the computation of the contact length distribution. Because in most of the cases, humans don't have this only one contact length. They're not just like you know, stepping on one all the time. They move from like two contacts to one contact to another contact, and I sit and I have like multiple contacts all the time, and I'm shifting these multiple contacts all the time. So when we have the inverse dynamics computation and the parameters, we have access to the parameters. We can compute the global branch. But what we want to do is now we want to distribute this branch. And put the appropriate force under each contact point. So we started with a quite simple task of like sit to stand with a semi-planar model because we have a planar model for the legs, but we have then um, a semi planar model for the arms, and this is the work we've been doing in collaboration with our colleagues at here in, uh, in Montpellier and uh, also uh, in Lyon. And so the idea is with the semi planar model, 
When we're doing stick to stand with handles, we will have contact at the foot, at the back, and at the ends. And so what's happening when we do our computation, we have the whole force and how we want to split it under these three contacts. Or sometimes there is no contact, so we know it has happened here. And so we had our, we start with our model. We do the personalization, so we have a very specific individual model specific uh, dynamic model. And then from that, we do the range computation. So this is just the experimental setting for the testing. So we measure with the force plate the force, of course, uh, for uh, the calibration, the dynamic calibration, but also after that for um, the cross validation of our results. We have handles here that are equivalent for sensors because we want to do the validation. So we need to have the forces here, but as a target, you don't need the forces in the end because you don't need it for the computers. And same thing with the uh, under the chair, we have like it seated on the force plate, but you don't really need that either. And so we have a, a more like session. So these exercises are just for the dynamic integration of the model. So that we have the accurate model parameters, and then we can do an accurate dynamic computation. And then what we have is this. So um, the blue curve here is giving you the forces at the end. The yellow one is giving you the forces under the chair at the bottom. And the green one is giving you the forces uh, at the fit. So this is the ground, the horizontal ground reaction force. This is the vertical ground reaction force. And this is the moment of force uh, at each of the contact points. And so the dark line is the one that we computed. And then the green, the plain line, uh, the solid line is the one that we measured with each of the four centers. And so what you see here is like, it's more or less, so we're trying to, we're doing some kind of like optimization. So we're optimizing, um, trying to minimize the joint torque uh, that would allow us to do this kind of uh, of exercises. Um, and so what we see here is like, of course, for the vertical force, it's very easy. We have a very good and accurate uh, estimation of what's going on. But still for the uh, moment of force and for uh, the original grand horizontal uh, reaction force, we still have a, a fairly good uh, reconstruction. Uh, with the ends, we are having the participant, which is an active participant, so it didn't really use the end, but it didn't need to pull on the handles to, to sit and to stand. Uh, so we have very, very low force here. But we're not feeding our model with any, like, a theory model or whatever. We're just using uh, this, like, minimization routine. And, um, and so uh, it turns again that with this kind of like personalized model, it is possible to do this kind of computation. If your model is not personalized, you're having a larger error. And we have shown that uh, when your model is not personalized, you can have more than like, uh, for example, a 20% error in brain force or in computation of forces. Uh, in terms of, uh, of like uh, center structure, you can have like error that goes to like, from like 10 times the error that you have when you have a personalized model. So it's very uh, dynamical task. And so um, it shows again that these are like only possible when you have a personalized model. And so one of the last things I would like to show you today, um, it's something that we've just been starting to work on and we have very interesting results. If we're using this personalized model, now we can do a lot of dynamical computations. So what we were interested in is like, I heard this morning, I'm sorry, I left later here, uh, I don't know what to talk, um, but um, using inverse optimal control and the basic of inverse optimal control, which says that like, there is some kind of optimality in the motion. And this optimality might change depending on the task and the process we're achieving. We're not interested in doing motion segmentation. So if you look at what's happening, and tell me if I'm wrong, because for me, it's kind of new. If you take this example of like drinking from a glass, um, somehow, roughly speaking, um, if we use the classic inverse optimal control approach that says that there is one optimality, tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> that there is one optimality uh, that is optimized during the task where we could eventually cut the task in several pieces. But the idea that there is no optimality, then um, after that, 
the work said that, like, uh, from my uh, Barrett said that, uh, well, there is not just one optimality. There is, like, a composite of, like, optimal functions we can optimize. And there could be several codes that could be optimized. And so uh, we decide to have, like, one cost function optimized throughout the test. And if you look at how you really reduce segmentation from kinematics, that's what we do. Like, 99% of people do segmentation from kinematics. It's like, well, we have here somebody idle, then somebody is raising his arm to, like, grab the glass, then he grabs the glass, then he raises his arm, then he drinks it naturally, then he lowers the arms, and then he's idle again. That's how we would segment. Of course, we like it's level segment, but we are interested here in this class. Okay. And so if there are different motions and different optimalities, what we were assuming is that, well, for example, this is a full example because we have no idea exactly what's happening. But if we use any like simple optimal control, what we guess is that like, well, while the person is idle, they might be like optimizing energy. And then when they're changing from one task to another, maybe it's smoothness, then it's precision, then it's smoothness, and then again energy, and then smoothness, and then precision, and then smoothness, and then again energy. And there may be like very like many changes during the execution of the motion when the optimality is changing. And so by tracking this optimality, which we don't know actually what it is, uh, by tracking the changes in the optimality, we might be able to segment the motion. And so we decided to work as a basis uh, with the work on Barrett and this function that he was uh, using, plus the two. And so what we're trying to do is to try to find the basis weights, CJ, here, that are in front of the cost function JG. And the cost functions that we use are one of these components, we have these nine cost functions. So we have nine cost functions, the sum of nine cost functions, so multiplied by the weight. And this weight we want to optimize. And we're using a sliding window over the motion that we want to optimize. I mean, over the motion that we're uh, investigating. A very short small window. And on each of the small window, we're looking for the weights and see how the weights between the different components are changing. So see how the controller potentially is changing. And what we obtained, so we were working to start with, with a very, again, simple 2D model of squats. What we obtain is that, so if you look here, this is the joint angle for uh, the ankle, the knee, and the hip. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven repetitions of squats. And uh, here are the segments that we found when we do manual or kinematic auto segmentation. So basically, we have here, like from here to here, it's going down, from here to here, it's going up. Then it's idle, standing, then here going down, going up, uh, idle, standing, up, down, idle, blah, 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 blah. And when we apply these IOC methods with the sliding windows, what we obtain, and these are like the different colors, so you have to see the green as a whole, like greenish thing, and the blue as a whole bluish thing. And here we have some like small differences, new colors appearing. But what you see is that in these very small windows, and we're sliding over the motion, and the estimated weight, you can clearly see one optimal function, like weights, like that reproduces exactly the squats and the segmentation that we had uh, when we're doing this kinematic segmentation. So what I want to see here, and what I want to, you to understand, is that like, well, we don't know if the basis that we're using for the estimation is good. That's the big, big problem with IOC, right? We'll never know how many functions we need to optimize. We tried with nine functions. Actually, we tried with 12. We tried with 13. The functions, like the weight in front of the functions, might change depending on the basis that you're using. Because we might be missing controllers here. We might be missing what's going on. But for the purpose of segmentation, here, we don't care. Because with at least these nine cost functions, or 12 or 13 that we tried afterwards, we have clearly here this like, oh, this is idle, this is idle, this is when somebody is squatting. So we can clearly see that weights are changing, control is changing. I don't know exactly what's happening. I could tell you that like when the person is like standing, the blue is like energy. And that would be right, that's what we found. That because energy was in the pool of our cost functions, 
but I could change the pool because sometimes the baby and then I probably would have different results. And the green one, if I tell you that here, the green one would be the optimization of the position of the trunk. Here, because we're basically in the cutting space, and the trunk is the only thing that we're really controlling. We don't care for the rest. But as the time evolves, you can see here like new functions appearing, color is slightly changing. So when people are starting to get tired, the way they optimize their motion is slightly changing. I'm just optimize. The way they're like, we found the motion uh, is slightly changing. So it turns out like, we still have like here the potential of segmenting, but things also are changing here. But as I was saying, it is changing. It depends on the basis that I was taking here, of course. So right now we have no idea about what's really happening because what we found depends on these assumptions. So that we can take notes with what we want to do. So, um, so yeah. So I would like to kind of like conclude here uh, by. In, like emphasizing on the side that it's really possible to build individual precise dynamic models, at least precise, as precise as you can measure with the equipment that we have right now. Um, but it's like, quite simple to use and to adapt this model, and it requires very little computation because basically everything you need to do that is like if you are doing motion capture and if you're doing dynamic computation, you have already everything in hand. So it's very simple to implement. There are multiple applications. I only cited three of them, which are this personalized and very accessible at and rehabilitation and support uh, motion analysis with the stroke patients, but we also did the same thing uh, for like athletes and work also in collaboration with our colleagues in Toulon or say uh, for a lot of uh, different applications. Um, it can help also for post-disease design because then we have access to the pure and the real information and so we can recreate uh, prosthetics that have the same dynamic components uh, of the system. Um, and it can be very useful also to control um, these prosthetics. And also we can use the cosmetic control. Um, it's very nice because now we have access to the computation of the external branch without having to measure the contact forces. You measure, like you have, like you do your experiments once, you need a very small force plate, and then you're free to move in your whole motion capture range. So a lot of people will have like one or two force plates, which is basically like one square meter, and they have a motion capture studio that covers like 20 square or 40 square meters, or even bigger. And now because we have this kind of competition possible, you can use your full motion capture studio. You don't need to just like stick on your force plates. You're free to do whatever you want, what, which motion you want to do. And as I showed, we can use, for example, inverse uh, optimal control for segmentation. And um, there are a few new next steps that I would like to investigate that I found very important. The first one is to do optimal and automatic human body model generations. I think it's a big um, issue for everyone. It's like, well, what is the best and the most appropriate model? when you want to do motion analysis. How many degrees of freedom? Do I have to go with the, I don't know, 100 degrees of freedom model? Do I really need to bother with such a big complex model? Or can I go with just like a 60 degrees of freedom, very like degrees of freedom simple model, or like a CDOS model like I showed you for some squats or uh, motions? Well, I think with the data that we're collecting, we already have the answer. By just looking at this data, we know we, we, we can extract, we don't know. We can extract what is the best model. And by starting with a complex model, by using the data that we are measuring, uh, we are working now in generating automatically the most, accurate, the most appropriate model for the data that we are measuring. So if you're measuring like just a step of motion, but you have a 50 degrees of model right now, a degrees of freedom model right now, well, we can, by just using the data in your 50 degrees of freedom model, we can just say, like, well, eventually you just need 12 degrees of like, freedom. You don't need to use the 50 degrees of freedom because you have this marker placement, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, when, right now, we're trying to do that. And the last thing that I think is very important 
Um, that might be a debate for some, but I think the best idea for us is probably to couple. It's to couple model-based and learning, and in particular for IOC, because we have access to the models for IOC in terms of like dynamics, computation, and these kind of things. But as I was mentioning, we don't have access to the basic functions. We don't know which are the basic functions. We can make all the assumptions in the world. We we'll probably never know which one is right. Unless we like mathematically can prove that the basic functions that we're using are covering all the potentials that like human brain is using to control like the, the motion, which probably we'll never be able to do. And so right now we're just using probably a subset of the functions that exist. And in particular, when we look at like like fatigue and pain, things that you can even not even model or understand. So how can we like try to optimize something when like we say like well we optimize energy or torque or whatever when pain is in the loop? What do you optimize when there is pain? And so here it's very interesting to try to couple these with learning to try to learn the cross functions, but also and to go back again to this like like one kind of expression of the dynamic model is that we can also use the constraints because what's happening well if I squat. I'm starting right now, it's not. But then if I try to squat here, well, I can't really squat the same way because, like, I'm stuck with the table, right? I mean, with the desk. And so, these constraints, if I don't mirror it, if I don't know what's happening exactly, I will, it will definitely change what's happening in the component. And I won't see it. And so, by trying to identify these constraints that appear in the equations for the Lagrangian, we have to one solution also to try to govern the inverse optimal control um, identification towards a new direction where we could have a better understanding of what's really happening in the human body. So for example, again, taking pain as a constraint or taking physical or fatigue or other things as constraints. So I'd like to thank you uh, very much for your attention. I would also thank, like to thank, uh, to thank my students, a lot of my collaborators that are here in the room today, and uh, the funny guy is to support all the Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Chad from the Lion House presentation. I had a question about the, this question of the uh, body segments in the child parameter. We have alternative ways which we have published recently uh, regarding just having the external object. This is now the many ways to have it quite uh, accurate. And to use density model by modifying the thorax density because uh, it has been done on the uh, and not on living structure. We also obtain very nice body segment uh, parameters which are personalized. We do compare both methods because particularly when thinking to aging people, they are uh, disabled or son, they may be not so able to perform many methods to get that. And, uh, and so, what is your opinion about this uh, alternative method, which is also very, very straightforward? So, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, it's always been something uh, very important for us. So we've never actually compared, uh, we had the opportunity to try to compare with analyzed data, but at some point we didn't quite conclude. Um, and we never, we never been up to uh, the density model from like the envelopes, which are the new uh, things that are going on. And that seems to be very easy to, uh, to do. Um, because for us, once you have the dynamics equation, if you have your model, if you're, trying to, if you're going to compute the dynamics, data, uh, you already have all the elements to do the identification. And as I was mentioning, it takes only a few minutes, or two minutes, to do it. And to answer the second part of the question, when you said, like, uh, a lot of the population might not be able to do, like, very complex motions, it's very much related to the last, like, my, in the next step, is, like, also, like, a generation of models, uh, because, of course, we probably won't have people that can do um, all these kind of like very difficult motions, but the calculations that I showed you are actually obtained with very similar techniques. So 
people are just free to move what they can move. If they cannot do extreme motion, it doesn't matter because they're not going to do extreme motion afterwards. Anyway, so if they're slow, they're slow, it doesn't matter. Probably inner thigh is not going to be very important for them. And it's never going to be very important because they're not going to do like super like fast over or throwing or these kind of things. So this exactly like using the data appropriately will drive the model in the right direction to these very specific things. And so it goes then with the like, next step about like uh, doing the auto self generation of the model. If you cannot move your elbow, if you like have a stiff elbow, whatever, well, you don't need to have both the parameters of the forearm and the arm because they're going to be one link together, and that's what we're targeting to do. It's just to have the proper model for this very specific person. And so for us, it's as simple as like having a density model because you don't need an extra equipment. You already have everything. We do. Yeah. So we have, um, we have access to uh, confidence intervals, and then we do also some uh, validation by using non weights like attached to the body. Oh, okay. to, try okay. to be sure that like we can actually identify these weights accurately. Okay. So we're, we're good like with the resolution of the equipment they're using. Yeah, and um, I think that is it. So, is there anything that, um, is it so basically you're saying that there is no way to 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 um, I'm pretty new in the field of indestructible control, so I would say like probably like like naive things, but I really love the idea of the indestructible control. The idea that like there is something like underlying motion control in humans that we don't understand, and so trying with these different bases is very interesting. Um, and so that's why I think like. But this experience with the motion that we're testing, we're testing the squat, which is different motions that were tested uh, like from the babies that were used because the, the babies that we're using for the identity for the uh, optimization were mainly used for uh, upper body motion, so reaching on, reaching in these kind of things. But with squats, we tested with nine test functions. And then I had this idea that, like, well, but like, because it's like lower body motion, one thing what would be important would probably be balance. Right? I mean, we're not going to sell at every like cuts, right? And so we're just like, well, why don't we put COP in the cross functions? And we added COP in the cross functions, and then we had like COP appeared as being very important and completely different than the previous results, except that we still have the same notations. And so we're just like, well, then if we had something else, what's happening? And we added something else, and something else. I mean, whatever you can think about. As soon as we don't have a clear representation of the space that we're trying to, I mean, optimize in, we only have that PCA. You have like maybe we have like only nine or ten or twelve components mm -hmm. of the overall space that are the that is not even the principal component here. It's the one that we talked about. What I'm thinking is like really learning here is very important. And adding up these constraints, because I think that the constraints are also something that are, is really like driving the motion. The constraint that could be like physical, real constraints, or the yeah. constraint that I was saying, like pain or fatigue yeah. or these kind of things, because they're going to also give us information. And so, as I was saying, if you look at the equations through the multiplier of the Lagrangian, uh, we have access to these constraints and we could learn or identify these constraints and then try to see how the kind of like counterbalance does the whole functions. It just gets uh 
Totally right on what you think. So the segment will depend definitely on the um, on which space we want to segment. But our guess was, and weight might be a different. I mean, we we might not optimize. I mean, we don't know. I mean, it's in human, so human might not be passive walkers actually, right? I mean, they're not. But um, but so then there might be at some point, I don't know, a burst of like a controller that just is going to say like this is a new step. Um, but our idea was just like, well, we're going to ask him, and this is all about kinematics. It's just like we look at the motion and we said, like, we can make here. But what is the weapon for that? And so our idea was just like, well, if you look at it, like, composer, they might be giving a different segmentation, but they might be also a better segmentation, a controller based segmentation. And this controller based segmentation, when we want to do further analysis in terms of control, might be more appropriate than the kinematic based segmentation. So if you look at the results of the team, actually, we find the segments, but it's not exactly the same segments, right? It's not exactly the same length. It's also like zero ways and everything. And it's like it's meaning over time, because, like, even when we look at the data, we said, like, oh, it's up and, like, down and up and down and up, but this control is quite changing over the time. Because there is something remaining. I'm not just like from top to down, and then there's something still thing there. And then I go down again, and there are maybe preparation for that, and there might be things changing over that. But we don't see how the can from the kinematics, but from the controller we can see that. And so we told I totally agree with you, we are segmenting in a different space. But this space is not as less valid as another one. So just follow, just follow up on, on what uh, Jean Paul said. So, it, from an optimal uh, control perspective, segmentation does not make sense at all. Like, the reason you raise your arm and you idle and whatever is because you want the water to end up in your mouth at the end of the day. So that's the only thing that matters. And the entire movement is come out as trying to get to that goal. So, just because there's a balanced segmentation in cost of your mind for dynamics, that, like, when you actually do optimal control, that, that, that makes no sense. If you start talking about switching cost functions, now you have to postulate yet another controller on top of it that decides which cost function to switch. And now you have to ask, well, what is the cost function for that controller switching on cost function? So it becomes a, sort of an infinite recursion. I mean, if you certainly do that, and you get something that intuitively makes sense, but, but if you look at the math, it's just the whole notion of segmentation is not really consistent with what you want to optimize. Like if, if you look at the whole important learning literature, for example, the whole point is that there's one scalar number that's a reward, whatever, you know, skin or say, that has optimized, and then the whole sequence of behaviors is constructed so that you get that one thing at the end. Yeah, so it's, it's true, like, in terms of, like, you, you have to look at, like, I mean, through the whole task, if you want to see, to understand the purpose of the task. But it doesn't, 
it doesn't change the fact that the controller is going to change the cost from like the I mean, I like to say the controller because um, I mean, we don't know. Uh, again, like because of this basic problem, like the events are changing, but we don't know what's happening with them. But it just because the events are changing, we see that things are happening. And it's not just one single like the task of like doing the squat is this. It's not just like. Here, like, I'm not going to say mentally like, every time something's happening. I, it's just like this is one squad, this is the second squad, and this is like when people are arguing or whatever. And the cards, I said the cards are changing, but we don't we don't look at like it through the whole task because we are working on very specific like small windows. We don't see it through as a as a task per se. I could say with a goal, and that's why we have we need to have all these cross functions. That's why I was saying with like. Like in some cases here we are like the green are mainly like this like also uh like confusion space uh, control and this will be more like energy. But because we don't even know for some tasks actually it's not there is a, a real goal. Like the first task you might think that is just like you know bringing your knees and going up and down. But what is it actually? What are you resting with? I think I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion, of course.